Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today our topic is inflammation or oxidative stress. Which one is it? Today we'll be unpacking the difference between the two and the similarities between the two because they're super common in American and Western society. There are two kinds of chemical fires that can happen in people. They're very similar. Oxidative stress is one of them. Oxidative stress is that process of slow rusting. It's the process of oxidative stress where oxygen comes in and it changes how molecules behave and it ages them. It ages them by changing electron movements and by affecting protons, which are hydrogen uh, ions, and it, it changes membranes as well. So it makes membranes inefficient and it makes things rust and makes things age. So oxidative stress causes all kinds of problems. It's, it's very much implicated in cancer of all types and it's implicated in bipolar disease. William Walsh has talked about spending the last seven years studying bipolar disease and he's been very much of the opinion that bipolar disease has to do with oxidative stress throughout all kinds of populations and that it's less due to genetics. Certainly, if a person already has a genetic problem, oxidative stress will affect them sooner than other people, thus contributing to their biochemical individuality. We know that a lot of people have something wrong with them that's very unique, and the solution might be the same thing for all of them. And yet, the reason they get better is because they respond differently to all those different kinds of stresses. So if we have an oxidative stress, we can have many, many different kinds of, of problems. Some of them will be related to the lungs, some of them will be related to tumors and cancers, and some of them will be related to infections, some of them will be related to premature aging, mental illness, and energy production. So the patient could be very tired and fatigued. Inflammation, on the other hand, is a different problem that's very similar. They have a lot in common, but they have some fundamental differences. Oxidative stress comes in from the outside, and it's made from the inside by not having enough antioxidants and by having too much oxidation. Inflammation, on the other hand, is fundamentally an immune reaction. It's the body's immune response to a stress. So it's much more specific and it's much more defined in, and it's much more narrow. Even though both affect every organ in the body, the pathways that are chemically involved in inflammation are a little bit more focused than those of oxidative stress, which affects so many structures inside the cells and inside the tissues and organs. Inflammation is an immune response that has to do with mounting the initial response and the later response to some stressor. And our bodies are pretty intelligent, our brains are pretty intelligent, and our minds have this wonderful innate intelligence that sets us up such that if some stress happens to us, an emotional stress, an environmental stress, a chemical stress, we mount the first response, which is a defense. It's designed to fixate the problem, to compress the lesion, to contain the lesion, to fight an infection, to stabilize a broken bone. Whatever the problem is, it's the immune system designed to send more blood to the area, to splint and swell and shunt blood either from the area or to the area, usually to the area. It's designed to splint muscles and rigidify the, the organ, and it's designed to bring white blood cells to the area and activate the cascade of a battle. It's the ability to fight the loss of blood to bring platelets to the area, its ability to fight infection, its ability to fight poisoning, and of course to manage trauma when we break our bones or get hurt or stabbed or bitten. Because remember, these mechanisms formed in the Stone Age, in the Paleolithic Age, and before, which is you know millions of years, millions of years ago until about 15,000 years ago, the onset of the Neolithic or the New Stone Age, with the advent of farming. Inflammation involves this first phase of repair, but it also involves a later phase of rebuilding. So the inflammatory markers can also be involved in the rebuilding phase, and sometimes that rebuilding phase can be messed up too. A person can over-rebuild something or under-rebuild something after they've been injured. So let's say they break an arm or they sprain an ankle or they get a lung infection. Whatever happens to them, they might deal with the acute trauma or the acute infection immediately and do it quite well. And then later on, they might have a, a, a wayward path of repair where they don't repair very well or they over-repair some tissues or under-repair them. And all of that can be measured and looked at by a good clinician. They can look at the healing process and say, what's going on with this? How is the scar formation? How is the scab formation? How are the fibroblasts that come into the area and the chondrocytes that replace them to make healthy tissue after the first alarm comes to put out the fire? So really the first phase is putting out the fire and stabilizing, and the second phase is rebuilding tissue back to its normal process. And, and its structure so that it's strong and aligned and able to withstand forces once again. 
the inflammatory process can take over a year. The first initial problem may be just two weeks to four weeks to six weeks, maybe eight to 12 weeks max. But after that, there's remodeling that can take up to a year or longer to remodel structures and tissues. So this gets to my favorite phrase, which is, you know, aging is not the problem, it's sick people getting old. When people get older, we have to understand which process has failed. Was it a deficiency? What was the problem? Was it a poisoning? Was it some oxidative stress? So we can measure some of these things. Some of the, the similarities about these are between oxidative stress and inflammation is that they're whole body. Both of them are whole body. Both of them affect many different organ systems and can make um, people worse with genetic tendencies. Both of them can affect many different diseases. The differences are that inflammatory process usually involves a little bit more of the immune system and it involves autoimmunity. It involves the gut uh, very much more acutely and it involves in many cases the skin a lot more and it involves processes that are measured in the blood. We can measure a lot of it in the blood. Oxidative stress is a little harder to measure. There are a few measures we can measure in the urine like O8 hydroxydeoxyguanosine which is a measurement in the urine that is a measure of oxidative stress. There are other oxidative stress markers and we'll go through those another time in our class but that's probably the most effective one that's in urine testing for um, organic acids. The other thing that happens with oxidative stress is it's much more related to mental illness. So oxidative stress does give you inflammation and it gives you excess beta waves and beta spindling in the front of the brain and all over the brain. I've been talking with some of my interns and it can definitely cause focal problems, focal encephalopathies as well as global encephalopathy. The common mistake I think is to assume that always and forever any metabolic disorder must flare up the entire brain uniformly and make the waves that are altered in a QEG and the symptoms that happen always uniform. That's really not how it happens. People will have genetic tendencies and other weaknesses that are that are structural and that may give them a focal area that gets on fire first and that happens before the rest of the brain gets messed up and that can happen in chemical exposures. Whether it's a toxic exposure, whether it's an intolerance to a food, or whether it's a deficiency of some cofactor like a vitamin or a mineral. So a person can have bipolar, they can have all kinds of symptoms caused by either inflammation or oxidative stress in their brain, and that can give them mental health symptoms. The cure for, for these is, is a little bit different. In the case of oxidative stress, we don't want to say that hyperbaric oxygen is wrong because I love hyperbaric oxygen. We just want to say that if a person gets oxygen and oxidative stress from chemicals, then what they're going to have to do is, is be able to calm the reactive oxygen species or the free radicals with other types of, of free radical quenchers. And the most powerful free radical quenchers are things like glutathione and superoxide dismutase and not being exposed to to pollution, especially air pollution, car exhaust is a major cause of oxidative stress. Just stress in your brain, just, just being a stressed person. Being able to meditate and calm down is very useful for, for oxidative stress control. So we need to make sure that we have lots of minerals that are antioxidants, things like selenium, but not too much because selenium can be toxic zinc, magnesium. We want to make sure that we have the fat-soluble vitamins and the water-soluble vitamins, both of which are oxidative stress uh, quenchers. So that would be vitamins A, D, E, and K2, as well as vitamin C and the bioflavonoids and the carotenoids, which are cousins of vitamin A. Many of them are water-soluble and not just fat-soluble. Things like beta-carotene are carotenoids. And so that's the process that's going on. And, and the oxidative stress really happens inside the mitochondria. The mitochondria is basically the fuel cell. It's just like the fuel cell in a car. It's like a lithium battery. It's got a double membrane inside it and it allows electrons to move across and oxygen to move across and power to be generated. And so that process of generating power using protons, electrons, and oxygen moving across a membrane is really the foundation of this oxidative stress. So we need antioxidants to get rid of that. We need to get rid of, of those pollution forms and, and ideally we need to calm down our diet. Many times our diet is full of oxidative stress, mostly from processed foods, processed carbohydrates, trans fats, and glycated fats, which is fats that have been partially burned and damaged. Now, we do that in our own bodies. We burn and damage sugars and carbohydrates and proteins by having an uncontrolled metabolism. And that usually happens in people that have more processed and refined carbs than they do saturated fats. It also happens quite a bit from omega-6 and PUFAs or polyunsaturated fats. That's true for inflammation too. In both cases, oxidative stress and inflammation need that dietary change of less carbs, less refined carbs, less chemicals, less GMOs, less food additives, less coal tar dye derivatives or petroleum products, which are artificial colors, flavors, and preservatives. But they also need more saturated fats that are healthy, more complete proteins that are nose to tail proteins that include collagen proteins, not just skeletal muscle proteins like steak and burgers. 
you know, like chicken breast, for example. We need to truly have all of the collagen that comes from things like bones and cartilage. So that's the, the general idea for both of them. Inflammation needs a different kind of molecule, and it's a little more complex. Inflammation needs larger molecules, and oxidative stress needs much smaller molecules and atoms because reactive oxygen species are very, very simple, and inflammatory molecules are much larger. Inflammatory molecules we can look for in the blood and the urine. Probably the most famous is interleukin-6. These are chemokines or cytokines that are released by cells that are tissues that release signals that tell other cells we're being invaded, we're injured, and we need to react to it. And so they're signaling molecules like little hormones. And the way to calm those down is very, very similar, but a little bit different. And so for that, I like to use turmeric. I like to use Boswellia serrata. I like to use uh, curcumin, which is in turmeric. I like to use uh, rhodiola rosea. And certainly you can still use glutathione and N-acetylcysteine for that kind of thing, even though I mentioned those for oxidative stress. And you can use all the same vitamins for inflammation that you use for oxidative stress. The fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K2. You can use vitamin C and the bioflavonoids. And again, for my carnivore buddies, you can completely go carnivore and not have to take any plant-based medicines. You can use organ meats, organ meats, especially mixed organ meats from freeze-dried, grass-fed organic animals is really useful to give all those different anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. It's a great way to get people under control and to get their immune system under control by reducing all those carbs. Certainly lectins have to be reduced. You've heard me talk about that many times, but that is the general idea. There's so many conditions and I, I want you to understand that these conditions can be addressed. How do you identify oxidative stress? It's pretty insidious and you can't really see it. It's not very visible. If any organ was gonna be affected, it would typically be the lungs in my view. It's the lungs and the brain is where oxidative stress gets affected and the heart. Those are the organs that are really hard to give you clear symptoms. Now, inflammation is pretty easy to see, although general inflammation is, is a little harder. General inflammation gives you kind of stiffness and general pain and myalgia or muscle pain. You feel soreness and stiffness all over. There's a few signs, and in the Latin, they call them ruber, calor, dolor, tumor, and functio leisa. So just for fun, ruber is redness, calor is heat, dolor is pain. Tumor is mass or swelling, and functio leisa is loss of function. Those are the five signs of inflammation, and you don't have to have all of them. You can have one, like you might have a sore tooth and it just puffs out and is hot, but it doesn't turn red. Or you might have some skin inflammation and it turns red, it's hot, but it doesn't swell, or maybe it does swell. You might have inflammation of your joints, like your knees, and they don't function well, so you have loss of function, but, and they swell, but they don't turn red. All the different signs of inflammation can pop up, and it's hard to tell the difference and I hope this has helped you understand what to do for inflammation and oxidative stress and their differences.